This video is brought to you by Green Man Gaming, who are selling Monster Hunter Stories 2 on PC for a tidy discount. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about that, or just click the link in the description below. Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin. This is a great game. Okay, so it's a tricky one to review for a lot of reasons, but mainly because the strength of Monster Hunter Stories 2, or Stories 2 as I'll be referring to it from now on, lives in all its finely tuned systems and its taut economy and its spare no expense approach to enemy animations and abilities and its gigantic armory of gear and weapons and the unrelenting attention to detail that exists across every part of the game such that none of it ever breaks or buckles no matter what you're doing or what you throw at it. All the things I've listed here are of course equally present in the mainline Monster Hunter games, but there it's just so much easier to showcase. Like, I can pull up the Sunni Legends Twitter account and I can show you a clip of this ferocious monster just getting absolutely wrecked by the incredible animations and aerobatics and weaponry that define the Monster Hunter franchise, and you can immediately be like, holy shit, that's crazy, I want to do that. The spectacle of those encounters, the majesty of the monsters, it all leaps out at you so effortlessly when you watch footage from those mainline Monster Hunter games, because there's no other game, no other experience almost, that looks quite like Monster Hunter. But Stories 2 is a turn-based JRPG, so even its most impressive moments cannot invoke the same feelings of awe. Our brains rationalize these images and file them alongside the familiar turn-based gameplay we've seen hundreds of times before. By virtue of its genre alone, Stories 2 is nowhere near as striking and unique as other Monster Hunter games are, because, well, it's not unique. It's a lot like many of the JRPGs you've played before. But if there's one thing I would like you to take away from this review, it's that Stories 2 is no less a Monster Hunter game than any other Monster Hunter game before it. This is not some discount dollar store dalliance designed to squeeze a few dollars out of the license by simplifying it and repackaging it. There were no corners cut here. Stories 2 is at least 50 hours of campaign content, and that's a quick playthrough. Then there's the end game content, the PvP, and the co-op expeditions. There's at least 120 monsters to fight, and at least 80 monsters you can catch, train, and ride, and more gear than I could possibly count. More than any set of numbers could communicate though, Stories 2 feels authentically Monster Hunter because it retains the same focus on hunting, looting, and crafting. It took me a while to come to this understanding, but Stories 2 is still a Monster Hunter game. It's just utilizing a different combat formula to arrive at the same core loop. The exception to this though is the superb monster management stuff that sits at the heart of it, and with a feature so load-bearing, it's nice to know that Capcom have totally nailed it. The more time I spent with this side of the game, the more impressed I became by it. It's so good, and if it really gets its hooks into you, the process of raising and caring for your monsties could carry you through hundreds of hours of play, just the same way that killing monsters can keep you hooked for hundreds of hours in the mainline games. As much as I love this game, there are certainly some criticisms to be leveled. The game story has some fantastic moments, but they're very few and far between, and I don't think anyone would rank this story in even the top 100 best JRPG stories of all time. The world design is very limited, reusing a lot of space over and over again while being really held back by the Switch's hardware. The overall campaign feels very sing-song with a repetitive structure that you get a read on pretty early, and it essentially doesn't change for 50 hours with side quests almost always being simple fetch and kill quests. I think the most interesting discussion you could have around Monster Hunter Stories 2 is does it deviate enough from the core Monster Hunter formula? Many will say yes, but I think at least a few people will quickly identify the core gameplay loop of kill, loot, craft, repeat, and decide that they'd prefer that formula served up in real-time third-person action rather than in turn-based JRPG. To me, that's fine though, because that choice exists. Many people find Monster Hunter games extremely intimidating, too difficult, too grindy. Stories 2 provides a new entry point into the franchise, so that a whole new crop of fans can feel the terror of facing an Anjanath for the first time, or feel the satisfaction of crafting their first Diablos sword, only to then use that sword to cut off his stupid club-shaped tail. Stories 2 is not some radical reimagining of Monster Hunter. It's still just Monster Hunter, and that means it's still excellent. Let's start by talking about technical performance. I first played Monster Hunter Stories 2 on the Nintendo Switch when they put up a demo on the storefront a few weeks back. I came away from that demo with two clear conclusions. Number one, 
I really want to play this game. And number two, I really don't want to play it on the Switch. While the visual fidelity was fine even at 720p, performance was just awful with regular frame drops that didn't improve when I docked it. I think it might have used that extra processing power to bump up the resolution rather than increasing stability. I'm not sure. Either way, I did not review this game on the Switch. I reviewed it on the PC. But if the demo performance was anything to go by, then you're in for a shaky Switch playthrough. Having said that, Switch owners are kind of used to this by now. It wasn't unplayable, it was just kind of shit. Good thing that Switch Pro model is coming out soon, am I right guys? Oh what? It's just a larger screen and a wider kickstand? Thanks, Nintendo. Just what we wanted. Anyway, PC. I played this on an RTX 2080 Ti running at 4K max settings. This YouTube video is in 4K, by the way, so you can switch over to that if you're watching on a 4K display. In terms of PC options, it's simple because this is a Switch game that was ported to PC. It's not a PC game ported to Switch, which is something we'll definitely come back to. You can change your resolution up to 4K and your refresh rate goes all the way up to 144 hertz, which is great. V-Sync toggle, lovely. In terms of more advanced settings, as you can see, there isn't much. Shadow quality, texture quality, anti-aliasing, LED, which you shouldn't need to enable unless your PC is a bit long in the tooth. In terms of controls, there's full button remapping for both keyboard and controller, which is great. I played this game with a keyboard and mouse for a little bit, which was fine. It's a JRPG, so you don't need to worry about precise inputs or camera management like you would in an action game. 95% of my playthrough, though, was with an Xbox controller, which worked flawlessly. Speaking of flawless, performance. It's been a while since I've played a game that ran as well as this. Not a single frame drop the entire way through, not a single crash, not a single gameplay bug or issue. Flawless, top to bottom. Actually, there was one thing. When you play in full screen and you alt tab out, it sets you back to windowed mode and then you need to go back into the menu to re-enable full screen. That was super annoying, but other than that, an absolutely marvelous port, at least for me, your mileage may vary. This sort of performance should be expected though, since Monster Hunter Stories 2 isn't going to win any awards for graphical fidelity. The vibrant colors you see everywhere are really anchoring the art style of Stories 2, but they also anchor its technical performance, since these colors are doing an excellent job of distracting you from some very flat textures, some bland environments, and a real lack of detail on anything that isn't a monster or a character. Freezing frame on any of the battle arena screens, you can see that there just isn't much going on in the background, ground textures, lighting, etc. It's all very functional, letting the impressively detailed heroes and monsters steal the scene. Pop-in is a big, big problem. Uh, this footage gives you a sense of what I'm talking about with ground detail just disappearing after only a few feet, and there isn't even that much detail to begin with. So this is where we come back to that point about this being a Switch game that was ported to PC, not the other way around. It's very clear the entire time you're playing through this that this game was made specifically for the Switch's more limited hardware, which is why a decent PC rig will run rings around it, but it's also why it's never going to impress you with its technical wizardry. In large part, I really didn't mind how constrained the technical side of this game was, except when it came to level design, which felt very hamstrung and very bland. Stories 2 is a world made up of five or six zones, but a lot of them look really similar to each other, and even when there are differences, they feel like a different skin rather than a distinctly new environment with new topography or new architecture or new anything really. Levels are always wide open spaces that branch off into narrow caves and while the cave might be a rock cave or an ice cave or a lava cave, it's still just a cave. And many of the layouts of these caves are reused just with different skins applied. Obviously it would have been unreasonable to have expected anything close to the sort of graphical fidelity we saw in Monster Hunter World, but I think the JRPG format created an opportunity to serve up some more interesting level and environment environment design, and that opportunity definitely wasn't seized upon here. Credit where it's due though, I absolutely love what Capcom have done with the art style in this game. Stories 2 delivers a more stylized version of the architecture, characters, and monsters that you may or may not have seen countless times before, and it never stops being a thrill the first time you encounter a classic monster because you're eager to see the Stories 2 rendition of it. I know a lot of this won't be as exciting to anyone that played the first Monster Hunter Stories, but I didn't play that. This is all new to me and I loved every bit of it. The cutscenes are really where this visual style shines the brightest. Each of its characters squarely in frame so you can see their rich detail and also the humanity and personality that's been animated into each of them. That's a really big feature of this game in fact personality. It's just bursting with it in almost every moment. So yeah, the graphics aren't great, and yeah, the level design is kind of sucky. The canvas on which the Stories 2 adventure plays out is a simple one, but that doesn't make it any less an adventure.
Monster Hunter Stories 2 is a story-driven JRPG, but we should set the right expectations about what story-driven means in a Monster Hunter context. Monster Hunter games typically don't serve up much in the story department. It's usually like, oh, there's a big monster somewhere, you need to kill it, but first, kill all these other monsters. And your silent protagonist gives their tacit approval with a firm nod, and off they go to slaughter an entire species so they can make a new hat or something. Stories 2 does go further than that, but not by a lot. A terrible prophecy foreshadows the end of the world and puts this Rathalos at the center of it. You play a rider, a human who's just as comfortable killing monsters as you are taming them to be your obedient, rideable pet. You walk in the footsteps of a Grandmaster Rider and your grandfather, Red, who had a kinship with monsters like no other. Chancing upon the unborn Rathalos, your goal is to first protect the egg, then rear the Rathalos after he's born, all the while trying to steer him away from the terrible destructive fate that is his destiny. If you would ask me, should I play Stories 2 for the story? Question mark, I'd say, uh, probably not. It's by no means bad, but the JRP genre has a pretty story-rich tradition at this point. Some of the best video game stories of all time have been served up through the genre, and Monster Hunter Stories 2 certainly doesn't reach anywhere near that bar. At times, Stories 2 can be incredibly charming, as its cast of characters are all written with distinctive personalities and quirks that make them engaging to meet and fight alongside. Some of its story moments are so damn hype and heroic, and I was like cheering when the camera would frame things in certain ways and the symphonic score would kick in hard when the moment called for it. And I was also really touched at times by the bond between you and the Rathalos in your care. It's definitely a little cheesy, but unless you have a heart of stone, it's probably going to hit you in the feels at least once or twice. It's very well handled. The problem with this story is that it's a very uneven affair. The main quest line for the game will take around about 50 hours to get through, and the really great story moments I've described there, they probably total around 45 minutes to an hour's worth of cutscenes. There are other cutscenes in the game, don't get me wrong, but a lot of those are just filler, talking about some random monster you need to kill or whatever. In terms of actual plot-heavy cutscenes that move the story forward, it's pretty thrifty. Pacing is a big problem here. The game opens very strongly and you get a sense that you're in for a fairly relentless story-driven experience, but the middle of the game really drags, like 20 hours where there's just not a whole lot going on. It does rally at the end and I actually thought the conclusion was superb. I really loved it. But there was a lot of dead space in the middle that could have been cut. But that criticism could be leveled at a lot of JRPGs, I think. So if you're really into the genre, then this probably won't bother you that much. In terms of that main storyline and what you're actually doing, I think it's best to think of Stories 2 as akin to Pokemon, rather than, say, Final Fantasy VII or Persona, or any other truly story-driven JRPG. The structure of the story is always identical the whole way through. You arrive at a new location, you meet a companion who'll fight by your side, you need to earn the trust of the local villagers or help them solve some problem, which always involves killing some monsters. You kill four or so monsters, and then you'll face some big area boss, then you'll get sent off to the next area to do the same thing again. If there's one thing I would have liked to have seen from Stories 2, it's more diversity in this structure. It does start to feel very sing-song after the second time you do it, and then you start kind of gaming the structure, like you'll run straight to the next village when you enter a new area, because you know that there's going to be a companion to meet who'll fight alongside, and it's inefficient to fight alone, so you'll do that. Or you'll just run past entire caves of enemies because you know that the only thing that really matters there is the monster waiting for you at the end. Side quests are equally unambitious. They're almost exclusively identical to the quests you get in mainline Monster Hunter games. Kill these monsters, collect these parts, collect these items off the ground, etc. There was one quest that asked me to talk to some NPCs around town. Uh, that was about it. There were no side quests relating to side characters, stuff that would deepen my connection to them by illuminating some unique part of their story, and I thought that was a bit of a bummer. I think Monster Hunter games have always been extremely powerful platforms to create your own stories. The hunts that you go on, they're never the same twice, and I so vividly remember so many of them because of how tense and exciting they were. When it came to stories too, I'd really hope that they would invert that formula. Like, I wouldn't have the power to create my own story, but Capcom would give me a great one to sit back and enjoy. That didn't quite happen here. Similar to level design, the JRPG genre was a chance for Capcom to have flexed out with some more ambitious storytelling, some interesting main quest design, or new approach to side quests. They didn't do that. Instead, they chose to stick closer to the core Monster Hunter formula than I would have expected. Just like mainline Monster Hunter games, you don't play stories too to get to the next cutscene, you play to get to the next monster. That sounds kind of goofy, so let me explain what I mean.
So at the start of this video, I said that it took me a long time to realize that this is still a Monster Hunter game. Some of that had to do with the expectations I had walking in, since this was a JRPG, and some of it had to do with just spending time with the game to figure out its core loops and rhythms. When I did figure that all out, I came to realize that there are essentially two goals that are central to Stories 2. The classic looting, crafting, and loadout building that has always been part of Monster Hunter games, and the gotta catch em all style hunt for monsties. Let's talk about the gear game first. If you're already familiar with Monster Hunter, then you'd be intimately aware with how this side of the game works. In your travels, you'll slay many a monster, they'll drop many a body apart, and from that you'll craft many a weapon and armor set. There are six different weapon varieties here, sword and shield, longsword, hammer, hunting horn, bow and gun lance, and each of them have their own unique abilities, like the bow will allow you to apply status effects, or the hunting horn allows you to apply helpful buffs to your party, that sort of thing. The armor sets each have their own unique stats, offering bonus protection against certain types of elemental damage, as well as specific perks that complement your playstyle. One set might increase increase the duration of party buffs from your hunting horn, while another might increase your crit chance, etc. So let me say this, holy shit, there is so much gear in this game. As I mentioned at the start, you can't think of Stories 2 as some phoned-in affair, corners cut left and right. No, there is more gear here than I can count. At least 80 sets of armor that I discovered, and surely many more, given that I haven't even touched the endgame content yet, and I haven't discovered all of the monsters. There's probably a similar number of weapons. It's overwhelming how much there is, and it's all really meaningful. Each of them will send you searching for specific monsters. Each of them will give you specific stats that are really valuable in your build. Build. Each of them have unique perks that can open up entirely new options during combat, and each of them have their own unique model that looks awesome. The fashion game here in Stories 2 is just as strong as it is in any other Monster Hunter game, and at about the 25 hour mark you'll unlock Transmog, allowing you to wear whatever gear you like while looking however you like. And it's free! How about that, Bungie? Most embarrassing transmog system in his- uh, Never mind, I digress. 50 hours deep into Monster Hunter Stories 2, end game untouched. I lament that I do not have time to continue playing this game because I would love, love to continue collecting sets and building unique loadouts in the same way I wish I could do that in Monster Hunter World or Iceborne or Rise. The gear game here in Stories 2 is just as meaty and just as addictive as it is in the main games. The unique loop that Stories 2 brings to the Monster Hunter franchise is of course capturing and raising monsters, or monsties as they are known when they are tamed. The way this works is that you'll enter various randomly generated monster lairs, which are essentially those caves I mentioned earlier. At the end you'll find a monster egg which may or may not be guarded. If it is guarded, you will carefully steal this unborn monstie from its nest as its mother sleeps. Not gonna lie, I felt like kind of a dick doing that. You'll claim the egg, take it home, hatch it, and then the monstie will now be available to use in your party. You can have up to six monsties in your party at any time, plus a huge stable of them back home. There are at least 80 monsties you can catch and ride in Stories 2, at least according to the in-game Monstipedia. There might be more, I don't know. They each have their own base stats, but you can hatch rare versions of them with better stats. And these are pretty attainable, by the way. They're not like shinies in Pokemon or whatever. Each monstie has a set of what are called genes, which are a mix of stat buffs and abilities that make each and every monstie truly unique, as one monstie might be born with uninteresting stats, but an incredibly useful or highly leveled gene. After about 20 or so hours, you'll unlock something called the Rite of Channeling, allowing you to take one of those genes and fuse it into another monstie of your choice, consuming the previous monstie in the process also felt like a bit of a dick doing that. You also get a bingo bonus if you can line up three of the same elemental types of genes, which is kind of cool. The system allows for a near unlimited amount of flexibility, as you can give your fire monsties the ability to cast ice spells if you want to, it's just not that smart since you're giving up their bonus fire damage. But things like party buffs and heals and specific attacks that really fit your weapons or playstyles, you can tailor each of your monsties to your exact specifications. In this way, the whole monstie system is really just an elaborate and amazing extension of the existing gear game that has underpinned Monster Hunter from the start. It fits so neatly, both thematically and mechanically, that you can totally see why Capcom made a game like this. I really have saved the best for last here. 
combat. Now, I don't love turn-based JRPG combat these days. I played 30 hours of Persona 5 and I enjoyed it for its persona, but I didn't love its combat. I know that's going to trigger a lot of people, but I'm just being real with you. Pokemon, I just straight up died of boredom, but I think that's pretty much the worst turn-based combat from a AAA game right now. Probably another triggering opinion. I played some of Yakuza Like a Dragon and I enjoyed that because it was funny and weird and also quite visually interesting, but I only played around 10 or so hours, so I don't know how I would have fared over the full 60 hours playtime. I honestly can't remember the last time I finished a turn-based JRPG. It's been years and a lot of that is because I struggle with the combat. I absolutely loved the combat here in Monster Hunter Stories 2. Loved it. I'm not telling you that it's better than Persona or whatever, I'm just telling you something about it really clicked with me as its huge number of variables meant I was constantly making interesting choices that I never got tired of making. The foundation is the rock, paper, scissors attack model where each attack has an alignment that counters another. Enemies have attack patterns based on their damage state and your job as a player is to memorize these so you can counter their attacks. Your monstie has a default attack type as well, so a big part of combat is switching your monstie these around mid-combat so that they can counter whatever damage type enemies are throwing at you in that phase. That's just one thing though. In addition, enemies have body parts like tails and heads and claws and wings and you need to use the right weapon to deal maximum body damage to that specific part of their body so you can stop them from using attacks and also so you can collect those parts for gear, just like in the main games. In addition to all of that, you'll fight alongside an AI-controlled teammate who has their own monstie, and part of your strategy is to look at what ability they're about to use so you can synergize with it. Then there's the kinship abilities, which are kind of like an ultimate, and these are just so fucking cool. I mean, look at this. Okay, This was just one of those kinship abilities, and every single monster in the game has their own kinship ability that is totally unique and equally hype. I cannot believe how much work Capcom put into this part of the game, and I was always so excited to catch a new monster, take it into the field, and then trigger its kinship ability for the first time. It was always just so epic. See, where I struggle with turn-based combat is that it often feels very one and done, like I'm thinking about this specific turn rather than a broader strategy for the engagement. What Capcom have done with this combat model is create a framework where you always have to be thinking three or five or 15 moves ahead. You have to be thinking about which part of the body you're damaging, with which weapon, with which monster, what damage phase the enemy will enter when you hit certain thresholds, which specific drops you're farming that you really need to focus on, how and when you might want to trigger your kinship ability. So much of what you do has both an immediate and a delayed effect and you have to hold all this in your head at once, and it really feels like you're weaving a broader strategy more than you're just making individual discrete decisions. Like I said, totally, totally loved it. I'm not telling you that this is the best turn-based combat in recent years, I'm just saying that it's the turn-based combat that I've enjoyed the most over the last few years, and I really did not walk into this game expecting it to be half as good as it turned out to be. In addition to this 50 hour campaign I've described to you, there's also an end game that involves super high level monsters. I've not touched that yet so I can't comment on it, but it's sure to provide plenty more hours of grinding and crafting. In addition to that, there's also PvP and co-op play. On the PvP side you can battle against other riders. I can't comment on that either because I played it during the review period and there was no one to fight against. But it's cool that it exists and I hope the netcode works. This co-op play stuff is divided into two parts. There's regular co-op exploration where you can just go hunting for monsters, and then there's expeditions which require you to purchase a ticket using rare in-game currency. These award you a shot at rare monsters with better stats. Again, couldn't do any of the co-op stuff, no one to play with. By the way, just to be clear, you cannot play the campaign co-op. You have to do that entirely single player. The co-op stuff is all just like random exploration and the expeditions, that's it. Taking a step back though, 50 hour main quest line, and that is a quick playthrough. 80 monsters to catch and raise and gene splice, 80 plus gear sets and weapons to craft, an end game grind, PvP, and co op play. What a massive package Capcom have served up here. All for the ticket price of 60 US dollars, not a single microtransaction inside. 
Yes, Monster Hunter Stories 2 does not compete with other RPGs in the story, quest or world design departments, but it's not really trying to. Capcom know what the heart and soul of their franchise is, hunting and crafting, and now here in Stories 2, riding. Capcom are absolutely crushing it at the moment and Monster Hunter Stories 2 is yet another feather in their bulging cap. I definitely recommend Monster Hunter Stories 2. So that's my review of Monster Hunter Stories 2. And if you like the look of the game and you plan on picking it up for PC, then you may want to think about picking it up at Green Man Gaming since they're offering 18% off the ticket price if you use offer code SKILLUP18 at checkout. If you haven't heard of Green Man Gaming, then you've been missing out. I've been buying stuff from them for years because they always offer a decent discount on PC titles. Why I shop there is because it's not a grey market key reseller. Every single key they sell has been sourced directly from the publisher themselves. So there's no scammy stolen keys that end up getting cancelled weeks or months after you've bought them. It's all 100% legitimate, all money goes directly to the publisher, and all the savings go directly to you. Over 6 million gamers have purchased from Green Man Gaming over the years. That's a lot of people. Green Man have over 9,000 games in their library. That's a lot of games. And right now, they're offering an 18% discount on Monster Hunter Stories 2. That's a big discount. To get in on the action, just use offer code SKILLUP18 at checkout. Thanks Green Man for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.